So the 2024 Giro d'Italia is behind us, but as its overall victor, Tane Pogacar, by a margin of 10 minutes. In today's video, I'll be going over every team that competed and rating their performance from S tier, the best of the best, towards DNS, the worst of the worst, also known as they might as well have not started. Anyway, let's kick it off with Alpes in the Koenig. Their man for this race was Caden Groves, Australian sprinter, but reality is he's kind of that versatile sprinter that does not have the top speed to compete with the top sprinters on the flat, and that showed this race. Zero stage wins, a few podiums, but you don't buy anything with that. I do like how active they were at intermediate sprints and in the breakaways with Conchi, Hermans, but no stage wins means that they probably expected more from this race themselves, so D-tier performance, in my opinion, that's where they belong. Now, Little Trek is a very different story. They came to this race with one of the better sprinters in the world and finished it with one of the best sprinters in the world. Jonathan Milan really stepped up from last year. When it comes to absolute watts, he reminds me of the old Marcel Kittel days, but the team also did a solid job of positioning him. And the result is three stage wins and Ciclomino once again for Milan. Sprinting aside, they were kind of disappointing in the breakaway department and with Juan P. Lopez, but I still want to give Little Trek an A tier performance here because they were that good. On to the French teams then, let's start off with Cofidis. They came to the Giro with a not so great roster, but unlike Albison, they actually delivered a stage win, Benjamin Tumaf from the breakaway. And I have to give it to Anjolkovski, who was very consistent in top 10s when it comes to sprint stages, and even came second once. Relative to my expectations, they overperformed, but it wasn't outstanding, so B tier is where Cofidis fits for me. Groupama FDG, on the other hand, had a pretty terrible Giro d'Italia. They were only competitive for a stage on one day, stage H5 in the breakaway with Enzo Paleni. Honestly, I almost forgot that Groupon was even at this race, so DNS, they might as well have not started. And that trend continues with Arkea. Costu was active in the breakaway, a good rider, Biermans was solid in one sprint, but outside of that, I don't remember much from this team, so again, DNS, another French team down there. That's actually the third Grand Tour in a row where Arkea was completely irrelevant. That is something we can't say about the Cathlon Aje Desert because they performed splendidly. A stage win by one of the PP brothers, Valentin, and in addition to that, Andrea van der Ame also a breakaway victory, so two stage wins. Next to that, fourth in GC with O'Connor. I was thinking maybe he could fight for the podium, but just under that. And next to that, Team classification won by the Cathlon Age des Air. Now, if O'Connor had podiumed this race, then I would have given this team S tier, but because that didn't happen, I'm gonna give them A tier, still a wonderful performance. Tudor Pro Cycling is next, and this team is a team that needs to learn to maximize their chances for victory on sprint stages, because when your sprinter is Alberto Dainese, you should never help Little Trek with Jonathan Milan control the race. Instead, put a rider in the breakaway, make it harder for the opposing sprint teams to catch that breakaway, which means they spend more energy doing that, which means they have less resources in the final sprint to position their sprinter while you have more riders left to do so. Anyway, that aside, I do want to talk about Michael Storr. He's one of those riders where before this race starts, you gotta think, okay, normally he'd go for KOM or a stage win in a race like this, but reality is, Outside of Pogacar, the GC field at this race was not stacked, so top 10 in GC was possible, and Storr delivered. On stage 20, in clutch, he delivered that, and that's a solid performance, which probably saves Tudor's Giro, to be honest, so it's a B tier for me. Anyway, let's talk about EF Education Easy Posts. Opposite to Tudor, they didn't arrive with a sprinter at this race, and when it comes to GC, Chavez fell through the eyes very quickly. But on the other hand, when it comes to breakaways, they were very active. Honore, even with a broken rip, he was trying to get in breakaways almost every day. But it's Michael Valgren and especially Georg Steinhauser that delivered. The latter with a stage win on Paso Brocon and two other podium places in week three. I'm going for a B tier performance for EF, and that's thanks to Steinhauser. But the next team was even more successful. Sunal Quickstep. Three stage wins with Tim Elier, despite not having the, the best lead out in this race. And Mike, Michael, Michael Alaphilippe, who the fuck is that? Julian Alaphilippe also delivered a stage win with a solid two-man attack with Mirko Maestri from Polti Cometa. That was wonderful to see, to see Alaphilippe back in a form where he's competitive. That's what 
we've been waiting for. And finally, in GC, another top 10 for Jan Heerdwich is also pretty good. Simply said, an 8 tier performance for Sudal Quickstep, simply deserved. Now let's rate the Italian pro teams at this range. Let's start off with Poltico Meta. We just spoke about the attack of Alapholi plus Mirko Maestri. That Maestri performance, probably the best PR they could have gotten. And their breakaway activities was not just for TV. Pietro Bon almost won stage 5 for example, so that matters. Piganzoli also a top 15 in GC, and the guy's only 21 years old, so I'm very curious where he'll go next year. But anyway, all combined, I'd say a B-tier performance for Paul Ticometa. And the other Italian pro team, VF Group Bardiani, arguably rode even better. Honestly, everyone and their dog had high expectations for Giulio Pellizzari, and he delivered in week 3. He just missed out on two stage wins, which... I'm hoping in the coming years he can actually achieve. But on the other hand, GC-wise, Spozzo Vivo kind of fell through, literally fell in week one, I'm pretty sure. And next to that, Kovili, he was actually quite consistent in the mountains. When it comes to this team, I doubt a lot between low A or high B, but I feel pretty good today, feel pretty happy, so I'll give them an A. Thanks to Pelizzari, by the way. Astana might as well be an Italian pro team because their results kind of look like one. We've got in GC Fortunato with a 12th position in GC, so that's only one position better than Piganzoli at Poltico Meta. That being said, Lutsenko was looking okay before he got ill after the ninth stage, I think. In the breakaway, Scaroni and Velasco are pretty active, but they didn't achieve much. A C tier performance for Astana, saved by Fortunato, to be honest. Anyway, before we continue, this is what our current board looks like. But hey, there's plenty of teams left to come, so let's continue with Visma Lab. Kian Eitbrooks had a pretty rough run in towards the Giro d'Italia, not the best result in the run-in, but at the race itself, he delivered relatively well. He was in contention for the white jersey and for top 5. That is until he abandoned due to illness, and the same kind of happened with Koi in this race, where Koi was relatively okay in sprints, delivered one victory, and then abandoned due to illness. It's at least partially due to luck, but Vismalap has not had a good 2024 so far, and it continued with the Giro d'Italia, so I'm gonna go with a C tier, that's the max I can give. But hey, at least they were more present than the next team, Anton Marche, because that team... Binion was pretty solid in the sprints on the first few days, but he abandoned not long after, after a double crash. Mades Mikkels trying to fill in that sprinting role was relatively consistent in top 10, but that doesn't buy you much. And I just feel like they weren't as active in breakaways as they should be. So I doubt a lot between D tier and DNS, but I'll give them D because I woke up on the good side of the bed today. Let's talk about one of the most important teams in this race, Bora Hansgrohe, because when it comes to individual success, they were not successful, and that is partially because the roster they sent to this race was inherently flawed. They came to the Giro with a sprint train without a sprinter. Sorry, but Danny Van Poppel is not winning a Giro d'Italia stage. When it comes to GC, Florian Lipovitz, he looked bad on day one, looked great on day two, then had to abandon not long after, so he didn't really get to show what he was worth for the team, but the other guy did. Daniel Filippo Martinez, did a wonderful job this Giro. He made a step forward when it comes to consistency, significantly forward, because he finishes second in this Grand Tour. A podium for Bora Hansgrohe. I also believe that on stage 20, Martinez showed that he was the best of the rest, better than Thomas, better than the others, and that deserves for this entire team an eight-year performance for me. Anyway, let's continue with Movistar. When it comes to their sprinter, Fernando Gaviria, he's just not very successful these days, but he also is not very competitive when it comes to his position before the sprint even starts. During multiple sprints in this Giro, there was a lead out of Movistar at the front of the peloton in the last 500 meters while Gaviria's in P15, and that is just not very useful because that lead out will continue doing the work for all the other sprinters while it makes it harder for Gaviria to move up. Anyway, that being said, a wonderful ride by Pelayo Sanchez, who gets a stage win on the gravel stage, but also was very active on the other stages. And almost as valuable, Aina Rubio getting that top 10 at the end of this Giro, that's a wonderful ride because before this race started, I saw that guy as the oh, we can win a stage kind of guy, and getting a top 10 at a Grand Tour, that changes things. B tier is my rating for Movistar. DSM is probably going to be lower on my tier list, because when it comes to their sprinting squad, Jakobsen did not look like he had the base to even ride this race. And when it comes to Lund Andersen, let's just say that this isn't the Tour of Turkey. But Bardet was active, but maybe less active than I expected. I expected him to go for stage wins, he went for top 10 in GC instead. I can't really blame him for that, but... 
it's also kind of the one thing this team had at the end of the race. So I'd say a C tier ride from DSM. The next team, Israel, they were kind of invisible and it's partially because of bad luck because half their team crashed out early, but on the other hand, I didn't see the others too much either. So I'm gonna have to give them DNS as a consequence and that is uh, because they might as well have not started. The next team, Bahra and Victorious, is usually very active in breakaways, but that wasn't the case in this race because they had their eyes set on Antonio Tiberi, the cat killer, going for a top 5 in GC, maybe higher, and especially the white jersey battle against Ahrensman and Eitebrooks. And to my surprise, he was relatively consistent. A double mechanical on the Europa stage lost him two minutes, but outside of that, he only really lost time on the Livigno stage. And that makes it that Tiberi ends up 4th in GC? No. And that makes it that Tiberi ends up 5th in GC and wins the white jersey, which... I think he's great for this team, but Bauhaus didn't really deliver and when it comes to stage wins and breakaways, didn't really work out either, leaving Pulsholm, which would have probably won them a stage win anyway. I don't know, I'll give them a B tier as a consequence of all these factors. In the meanwhile, Jaco Alula didn't have a great Giro d'Italia. Caleb Ewan became a sunk cost fallacy in a similar fashion as Dainese for Tudor, meaning that the team is investing all their resources on sprint stages on that one rider, reducing the chance to get anything from breakaways in those stages. In the mountains, the Marquis, Plab, they all went in the breakaway though, and Plab was pretty good, the Marquis is not that great anymore, but on the other hand, when it comes to GC, Zana was in contention for top 10 in GC for quite a while until we got to the final week where he fell through on stage 20. I will go for D tier when it comes to Jake Alula. I was expecting more and that's why. Anyway, that brings us to our final two teams, starting off with Ineos Grenadiers. Let's start off with the positives. When it comes to Garain Thomas centered GC teams of Ineos, they usually don't give freedom to riders to go for stages. During this Giro, that was not the case, because in stage 1, Narvaez was allowed to go for the stage win, while Thomas was being dropped. On stage 4, Gana had the attack on Capo Mele, which almost got them a stage win. On stage 9, Narvaez did the same, which almost got them a stage win. So, in the end, all these opportunities were there, multiple days where Gana, Sheffield, Narvaez went in the breakaway as well. They got a stage win out of that, with Narvaez on stage 1. When it comes to time trials, I didn't expect them to beat Pogacar on the first time trial, but I was expecting Gana to win the second time trial, so it's nice to see they achieve that. Ineos is also very good in the last 10 kilometers of a sprint stage to keep their GC riders safe on important roundabouts or sketchy corners. But when it comes to the general classification, their strategies just aren't very intuitive. It's almost as if they come to a race hoping someone like Pogacar makes a mistake to then benefit from that. And reality is, if Visma Lisebike or Jumbo Visma in the last two years at the Tour de France had that same strategy of waiting until something happened with Pogacar, Pogacar would have won two more Tour de France's by now. Because Pogacar doesn't just make a mistake, you have to force UAE and Pogacar to make that mistake through your actions. But in hindsight, Gary and Thomas just wasn't good enough to begin with to compete for the victory in this race anyway. In the end, he does podium this Giro getting third and that's a wonderful performance because before this Giro started, my realistic thoughts for Gary and Thomas was try to get second at this race. He was the, the best of the rest on paper before this race started. He wasn't that at the end. Martinez was better. But getting third is still a podium, which to me, second or third, it differs, but the difference isn't that huge. And when it comes to Aaron's mom, the reason that he lost out on the white jersey and the top five isn't really the last two weeks of this Grand Tour. Outside of stage 20, he was relatively consistent, but it's the first two days of the race, because in stage one and two, he lost three minutes. But that aside, they finished third with Gary and Thomas, finished sixth with Ardensman, close to the white jersey, they got two stage wins with Narvaez and Ghana, were more freeing to those riders in breakaways. I gotta give them an eight-year performance anyway. So, with Ineos on the board, one team left, it's UAE Team Emirates, is a team of the winner, Tade Pogacar. Six stage wins for this team, but they had a bit of an evolution during the race. During the first week, Pogacar already showed that he was by far the strongest GC rider in this race. But the team around him showed some vulnerabilities. For example, in stage one, we had Bjerg pulling, and he pulled so hard that Novak and Grosschartner dropped before they even did any work. Next to that in breakaway formation phases, Pogacar often only had one or two teammates left. But that's the thing, a vulnerability is only a problem if there's an opponent that tries to exploit that vulnerability, which Ineos didn't. Bora and so forth were already riding for the podium anyway, so there was no one doing that. And by the time week two hit, UAE was already in full control, and especially in week three, there were stages where 
they rode perfectly. For example, are we gonna slow the tempo a little bit in the peloton on this climb to make sure Oliveira and Milano get over so they can ride the valley afterwards? They really were playing with the competition. Now, obviously, Pogacar won six stages, but I think he could have won more if they went all out every single day, which is understandable that they didn't knowing the Tour de France is coming. I also believe that this is the best Pogacar we've ever seen. Obviously, there is that question mark of can he keep this form up towards the Tour de France and how can we expect the form of Vingegaard to be at that race? But anyway, that's promising to be a good race, so I can't wait to watch the Tour de France in about two months, and uh, that's about it when it comes to actually... I haven't even rated you 80 Emirates yet. I have to give them an S tier. Like, if you win a Grand Tour and win six stage, I can't give you less than that. I almost forgot to rate the most important team in this damn video. God damn it. Anyway, that's it for today's video. What do you think? Did I underrate a certain team, overrate another team? I want to hear all your opinions in the comment section below. And I also want to see your tier list down there. So give me your tier list. I want to see where you place every single team in the comment section. Thanks again for watching today's video. And I'll see you next time for a similar video at the Tour de France. But in the meanwhile, some other content is coming. So I'll see you then. Goodbye.